So it's a great pleasure to uh, <clears throat> welcome you to um, this year's Per Jacobson Lecture. And I have today the distinguished honor of complimenting uh, Jaime's presentation of uh, Yaga Venu Valveri as a speaker for this occasion with a lecture entitled Society, Economic Policies, and the Financial Sector. He's without a doubt an authority on the subject, and I'm sure that his talk will be as inspiring <clears throat> and thoughtful as his professional trajectory has been. And indeed, as most of you know, he has led an exemplary career in public service. Uh, Mr. Reddy served five years uh, as governor of the Reserve Bank of India. And as Jaime mentioned, this position, I think he played a key role in directing India's financial development and regulating the financial sector in a prudent, uh, and, uh, you know, thoughtful manner, which doubtless continued, contributed to the country's strengthening of the macro policy framework and was instrumental in actually driving India through the, uh, very re to the recent crisis. Um, it's not an overstatement to say that Mr. Reddy's contribution to his country's economic development has been vital in the strong performance of India uh, has exhibited over the past two decades. Mr. Reddy has also been a chairman of the Bank of International Settlements, Asian Consultative Council, executive director for India at the IMF, chairperson of the uh, SARF Finance, a group of governors of the central banks of the South Asian Associations for Regional Cooperation, an advisor to the World Bank. Mr. Reddy has also had key positions in the Indian government, both at the state and central levels. Uh, he served as uh, secretary in, for banking in the Ministry of Finance, additional secretary in the Ministry of Commerce, joint secretary in the Ministry of Finance in the Government of India, and principal secretary in the Government of uh, Andhra Pradesh. In academia, Mr. Veri's contribution has also been noteworthy. Beyond his publications in the area of finance, he has taught in important universities and research centers. Uh, I will skip the rest of his academic uh, background. Let me just say that uh, as former governor of the Bank of India, I had the distinct pleasure of interacting very frequently with Dr. Vedi, including in Mumbai and in Mexico City. And I consider him an exemplary central banker and also a very good friend. So welcome. And we are here to listen to you now. Mr. Chairman and distinguished participants, it's a great honor and pleasure to be with old friends. And when somebody asked me after I left the job of governor, do you miss being a governor? I said, no, but I miss not attending the BIS meetings. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's a source of great enlightenment and pleasure. Uh, but somehow or other, at least two out of the four occasions I managed to be here. Uh, I am grateful to the Pat Jacobson Foundation, in particular Chairman Otis, for conferring on me the honor of delivering the Foundation Lecture for 2012. I did not have the good fortune to meet Pat Jacobson, so my familiarity with him is primarily through the references made to him in the second volume of the History of the Reserve Bank of India. He came across as a forceful personality who had an excellent grasp of India's economic policies and problems. He was obviously a very forthright person with impressive uh, foresight. I'm wondering what Par Jacobson would say if he were to comment on the recent developments in the financial sector. It would be an interesting uh, exercise if somebody tries that. Uh, the future of finance, and in particular saving it from a popular backlash against the global financial crisis, and related crisis management policies has rightly become a matter of great concern. There is broad agreement that finance has, as in the past, great potential to do good, which should be harnessed by all. However, it is essential to minimize its potential to do harm. In the commendable search for good finance, central bankers have not merely a stake but also have a legitimate role to play. 
From central bankers' point of view, there are several issues in this search for good finance for the future. But there are three interrelated issues that I want to comment on today. A. How to ensure that the financial sector serves the society better. B. How to integrate financial sector policies better with the national economic policies. And C. How to ensure that the financial industry functions as a means and not as an end in itself. Major issues confronting the finance industry for the whole of for the 21st century were articulated by Sir Andrew Crockett in this forum last year. The presentation today is partly inspired by that lecture and partly a per supplement to it. As all of us are aware, Sir Andrew has made an enormous contribution to the global community of central bankers. And therefore, I would like to dedicate this address to Sir Andrew. This presentation considers many issues that have been raised on the future of finance in the recent literature. In, we have a number of publications, particularly in the last couple of years, from many people, including Schiller, Robini. Uh, my reflections, however, are molded not only by a decade in central banking, but for more than two decades in uh, the provincial and uh, the union governments. So in a way, mine is not so much a finance view of finance, but in some ways a non-finance view of finance. Uh, and, and that's why I started with society, <laughs> economic policies and finance, rather than finance, economic policies and society. Um, there is some evidence or considerable evidence of erosion of trust and confidence in the financial sector, particularly in advanced economies. There are many reasons for the erosion of trust. There are differences of opinion between regulators, uh, markets, central banks, and political leadership on sharing the blame for this loss of trust and confidence. But I will not go into what are the reasons for this loss of trust and confidence because uh, th th this uh, gathering, this, this August audience is fully aware of that. However, it is possible to argue that erosion of trust if any, may be temporary, as seen in the past, when the financial sector faced crisis in the past. It is also possible that central bankers have no tools for managing society's trust, except by delivering their mandate through price stability and financial stability, consistent with maintaining employment and growth. But it is undeniable that maintaining trust and confidence in finance is essential for the good of society at large. My submission is that the mandate for maintaining financial stability, which often rests primarily on central banks, has two related dimensions. Namely, the avoidance of disruptions in the functioning of the financial system, and more positively, the promotion of trust and confidence in the system. If there is any wing of public policy authority that has a stake in building such trust, it is the central bank. Hence, the central bank should be watchful of developments related to trust in their jurisdictions and take a con conscious decision whether to monitor and act as necessary to ensure continued trust and confidence in the financial sector. The decline of trust and confidence is partly the result of the perception that there has been a comprehensive regulatory capture. Regulatory capture is comprehensive in the sense that not only regulators and regulated, but also political leadership and media are believed to be involved in the process of the regulatory capture in regard to financial sector. Again, there are many reasons for this. Uh, I don't want to go into that. But we should recognize uh, that finance and its some regulatory framework are somewhat intangible and difficult for a common person to fully understand. Hence, interested groups can tilt the intended policy changes in their favor by presenting their initi initiatives to shift equilibria 
between competing considerations as mere technical issues, a risk weight being increased here, there, it all appears very technical, but its repercussions are felt later and they are not easily understood uh, by uh, the people who are affected. So it is in a way far more vulnerable uh, to, to, to regulatory capture. Uh, deregulation to avoid regulatory capture was the answer in the past, but after the crisis, that seems to be not so correct answer either. Professor Levine observes that the absence of an informed, expertly staffed and independent inst institution that evaluates financial regulation from the public perspective is a critical defect in the performance of financial regulation. He suggests establishing a body that would submit a periodic report to the legislative and executive branches of government assessing the impact of financial regulation on the public. The body would be politically independent, independent of financial markets, and staffed with experts while having no official power over the central bank or other regulatory bodies. This may sound utopian, but perhaps it is worth trying in the present day turbulent market environment. Consideration may also be given to the formulation of a fair practices code for finance professionals, regulators, and academia, extending the idea mooted by the American Economic Association about having a code of ethics for economists. A similar approach has been suggested by Professor Schiller in the context of financial innovation, supporting the stewardship of society's assets. However, experience suggests that there are limits to the effectiveness of such codes. In fact, Ethical behavior can be felt and understood, but it is difficult to formulate it fully in a code intended for day-to-day -day operational purposes. Moral behavior in the final analysis is a matter of individual choice, but what best practices can do is to exemplify the inherent morality in the individual. My submission is that consideration should be given to evolving trustworthy institutional structures and adoption of best practices to reassure the public that the scope for comprehensive regulatory capture is being minimized. These assurances could be further reinforced through improving the public image of central banks, and in particular, the image of the governors. Let me come to a subject of special importance for developing economies, namely inclusive finance. Inclusive finance implies that the objective of financial sector regulation should be as much about protecting consumers as ensuring the availability of essential financial services to all sections of society, keeping in mind the expectations and needs of the common person. Emphasis on financial literacy by central banks has been advocated to enable consumers to take advantage of competitive efficiency. However, the issue is not of financial literacy, but of the behavioral patterns of common people dealing with finance. In this regard, many people, by the very nature of finance, are averse to apply their mind to make a proper choice. They're just a inner share, and it's too complex to apply their mind. In a way, therefore, we might have to consider something like a default option, that the people who don't want to apply their mind, then give a default option. And don't say that you have to choose and then they end up choosing the wrong thing. So I'm more or less advocating uh, the, what's been uh, advocated by Taylor in the book, uh, The Nudge. Uh, it is useful, uh, it could be argued that a competitive financial system, which is well regulated, keeping in view the needs for stability and consumer protection, would automatically ensure inclusive finance. Experience so far does not support such a view. Public policy in relation to the financial sector, therefore, needs to consider the expectations of large sections of the community, typically those of a common man. They are bound to be different depending on the society, but a few broad generalizations may be attempted. First, my own observation is um, that common people need a place to keep their financial savings in safe custody. At least in my country, it's necessary to ensure that rural women have a place to keep their savings away from their wayward husbands. 
Second, reasonable demand for credit for smoothing consumption between days and periods of income and expenditure, particularly in unorganized sectors, there's great volatility in the availability of employment. So the smoothing consumption is extremely important for them. Very often we think of credit for productive purposes, but smoothing consumption is far more important in unorganized sectors. Third, remittances or payments may have to be made within families or different locations or for various other purposes. And these remittance services are often a monopoly of the officially recognized or regulated banking or payment systems. And hence, regulators need to accept some responsibility for delivery of such services. Finally, from a common person's point of view, public policy should ensure the easy availability of simple to understand instruments in credit, capital, and insurance markets. In some advanced economies, regulators are already paying attention to excessive charges on retail financial services, including credit cards. Experience in some developing countries indicates that the involvement of public policy in expanding coverage of finance among the general public has had a beneficial impact. It is true that public policy experience with subsidized credit in some developing economies and with housing credit in some advanced, in some advanced economies has not been good. But inclusive finance emphasizes affordable access to simple products and not excessive leverage or at the cost of prudence. Of course, inclusive finance is not a substitute for the primacy of fiscal policy with regard to social welfare. My submission, therefore, is that we are in a world, in a world of expanded mandates for central banks, and inclusive finance should not be included, uh, should not be excluded from such mandates. Perhaps central banks could satisfy themselves and the society at large that between the markets and regulations, finance is serving the minimum needs of most common people while maintaining efficiency and stability. That would be the cornerstone for restoring trust and confidence in the financial sector. In particular, central banks could explore avenues for using technology and financial innovations that meet needs of common people. Now I'll come to the second part of my presentation on economic policies in the financial sector. Experience suggests that the overall benefit from financial sector in an interdependent global economy depend on A, macro policies at the national level, and B, the global financial markets and the global governance arrangements. It is tempting to debate the pros and cons of developments of the financial sector without a full recognition of the macroeconomic environment and of the functioning of product and factor markets. The right balance between free markets and appropriate financial sector regulation is ideally explored in the light of the significant role of macroeconomic policies in maximizing benefits and minimizing costs of this financial sector to development and welfare. The crisis and its management have brought about a better appreciation of the links between macro policies and the performance of financial sector. I will not elaborate this to this audience. The macro policy framework at the national level, which is admittedly critical for good finance, is determined by the sovereign with the legitimacy and accountability to its citizens. But macro policies at the national level have to take account of the deep and growing linkages between national economies and the global economy. An important issue, therefore, is the scope and limits for international coordination of national economic policies. It is instructive, therefore, to briefly analyze the evolution and efficacy of the most recent efforts at global coordination of the macroeconomic environment, for instance, through the summits of the G20. The initial stage of coordination through G20 summits was to avoid collapse in the financial system and to moderate the slide in the global economy through macroeconomic responses in both monetary and fiscal areas. There were simultaneous actions, very effective. The uneven recovery that followed led to differences in short-term policy actions among countries, but this was recognized as inevitable under the circumstances. 
More recently, country-specific <coughs> commitments to correct some imbalances have been attempted, but differences on the measurement of needed correctives and the timeliness of actions are stark. A possible reason for these differences is that short-term motivations at the national level seem to run counter to the long-term interests of the global economy. There, there are perhaps unmistakable signs of diminishing returns from the G20, despite initial achievements and the promise of greater coherence in future. One positive development has been that the demographic deficit, a democratic deficit at the level of global financial architecture has been somewhat narrowed. But there is as yet no coherent global macroeconomic policy. The global macroeconomic environment is essentially the result of the interaction between macro policies at the national level and national markets that are at different stages of development and that have differing degrees of integration into global markets. It is true that successful arrangements for global coordination while retaining space for national public policies are working well in certain sectors, aviation, telecommunication, possibly even internet. But they seem to get into difficulties in regard to macroeconomic policies and finance. Clearly, there is a need to explore why global agreements work reasonably well in some sectors, leading to acceptable and assured outcomes, while when it comes to macro policies and finance, such agreements appear difficult to arrive at and what we can learn from them. The basic assumption underlying the benefits of globalized finance is the existence of competitive efficiency in global financial markets. The assumption can be and has been questioned on several well-known grounds. Namely, the lack of a sound international reserve currency system, the absence of credible lender of last resort facilities at the global level, and the dominance of a handful of rating agencies and accounting firms without adequate evidence of market discipline are effective rules for their functioning. The leading rating agencies and accounting firms, along with few leading business news agencies, have continuous dealings with each other, which tends to reinforce the exercise of their oligopolistic power over markets. Further, operations of international banks, conglomerates, specializing in cross-border flows, combining traditional banking and risky investment banking operations, have close business and operational links with rating agencies, accounting firms, etc. The concentration of global financial power in a few entities with, mutual, with close mutual connections has considerable potential to undermine competitive forces. In assessing the competitive efficiency of global, market, global financial markets, it may be useful to make a distinction between the role of multinational banks, which have subsidiaries or branches in different countries, but predominantly operate in domestic markets and that of international banks, which specialize in cross-border financial activities, especially flows and capital accounts, both short-term and long-term. Experience has shown that multilateral structures that relied less on wholesale funding and forex swap markets have been less vulnerable to crisis. International banks are able to operate across different financial markets and countries with significant divergence in fiscal regimes as well as regulatory regimes. Because of these operations, international banks enjoy significant influence over the political economy in several countries. In the prevailing environment of global financial markets, some large global financial conglomerates are larger and perhaps more powerful than some of the central banks. It is clear that the experience of Euro, it's clear from the experience of Euro area that in effect the sovereign becomes the source of extraordinary intervention as the ultimate risk bearer in times of crisis. The problem arises when the sovereign's capacity for such intervention is constrained by globalization. This may be beneficial in many respects, 
but it could undermine the capacity of the sovereign to tackle the financial sector problems when they arise. The conduct of fiscal policy itself is dominated by consideration of the view of global financial markets on the sovereign solvency and its capacity to support the financial sector under distress. The extraordinary intervention by the sovereign and related fiscal measures are thus subject to the credit rating agency's appraisal of their solvency. Professor Amartya Sen has expatiated on this in the context of the euro area. Uh, these considerations may have a bearing on the conduct of both financial sector regulation and macro policies at the national level. In brief, my submission is that the prospect for credible and acceptable global governance arrangements to ensure a workable global economic policy and environment within which global finance would contribute to growth and stability do not appear very bright. I am not addressing a more fundamental issue whether global economic governance, ensuring common economic policies for all nations, would eliminate the benefits of diversity. Too much global policy coordination might lead to the universalization of risks of policy mistakes. My main contention is that good finance is essentially a function of good economic policies, and such good policies are primarily national, though significantly impacted by the global macroeconomic environment, which, as already mentioned, is not, a con is not a product of design. Approaches to regulation of the financial sector will therefore continue to be national in a global environment that is not necessarily conducive to all. The third section on the regulation of financial sector I will first refer to the optimal financialization. Not long ago, many countries recognized the cost of excessive regulation of finance and of financial repression. More recent events seem to indicate that excess financialization of an economy may also contribute to the crisis. It may be that finance is good for economic development over a certain period, but only if practiced in moderation. The idea of optimal financialization seems to have been accepted implicitly by the financial sector reform measures being contemplated in many advanced economies. At the same time, several developing and emerging economies are considering measures to develop the financial sector, in particular financial markets. In their quest for optimal financialization, the countries that are attempting further deregulation and development of financial markets would benefit from an understanding of how excess financialization manifests itself. However, the manifestation of excessive financialization may not be confined to finance. It may extend to commodity markets, corporate balances, and households. This excessive financialization occurred in many advanced economies for many reasons, and we know all of them. For many developing and emerging economies who are progressing on the path towards optimal financialization, it is no doubt necessary to avoid excessive financialization. More importantly, to explore the impact of finance on growth, ideally on the basis of empirical evidence. Research had traditionally associated higher growth with the development of financial sector, but more recent evidence on trade-offs between growth in the real sector and the financial sector is equivocal. The experience of Asian emerging economies so far indicates that the beneficial effects of deregulated finance relative to free trade may be overstated. Further, institutional rigidities and the state of factor and product market vary between countries and they do interact with the level of financialization. The subject is explored in a recent paper titled Reassessing the Impact of Finance and Growth by Chichati. It is a BIS paper. The paper investigates how financial development affects growth at both the country and the industry level. The paper shows, based on a sample of developed and emerging economies, that the level of financial development is good only up to a point after which it becomes a drag on growth. It also shows that a fast-growing financial sector can be detrimental to aggregate productivity growth. The, a recent IMF paper, 
titled Too Much Finance, confirms the broad conclusions of Cicetti's paper. Let me sum up the important findings. First, there is positive correlation between financial development and economic growth in countries with small and intermediate financial sector. Second, beyond the threshold, there are negative effects. And the threshold is tentatively estimated at private credit as a proportion of GDP reaching 80 to 100 percent. Third, the negative effect is not confined to crisis, but even in tranquil conditions. So crisis is not the only negative effect of excessive financialization. And fourthly, uh, and it, it could possibly lead to misallocation of resources in the normal circumstances. Fourthly, it is not very clear uh, whether lending, uh, whether bank lending and asset-based asset lending, greater emphasis on bank lending and asset-based lending would be more beneficial. That's a sort of an open question. The global financial crisis also brought into focus the downside of excessive debt. And, but then the issue is what is excess debt? This has also been brought out in a very interesting paper which covers the sovereign debt, the corporate debt, uh, and uh, the household debt uh, by Cecchetti, Mohinti, and Zempoli uh, in 2011. Uh, my submission is that more research is needed on what constitutes optimum financialization and leverage which could be different for developing and emerging economies relative to advanced economies, despite signs of some convergence in macroeconomic and financial sector issues. In any case, the direction of public policy relating to the financial sector in the near future will be characterized by increasing financialization in some countries which have less developed finance and restraining financialization in others where it has gone too far. On the appropriate innovation in the financial sector, operationally an important issue is the point at which an innovation requires a regulator's attention. In many industries, regulations address issues related to innovations. For example, in pharmaceutical industry, considerable experimentation is demanded and ex-ante approvals are required for marketing. In engineering systems, the consistency of innovations with network in which they are to be applied is often required to be certified by either an industry body or the regulator. In many others, innovations are left to the market test unless they happen to expose negative effects, in which case public policy may consider intervening. In brief, there are several industries which have been subject to different systems of regulation and they have stood the test of time. The financial sector should be able to draw lessons from such experiences, recognizing the unique characteristics of the financial sector. Such lessons will also help in differentiating between technological process and product innovations. Markets indeed uh, are indeed a source of many innovations, but there are examples in many industries where the public sector has been active in promoting innovations. I agree with Chairman Ben Bernanke when he said, referring to striking the right balance between consumer protection and responsible innovation, I quote, our goal should be a financial system in which innovation leads to higher levels of economic welfare for people in communities at all income levels. My submission is that central banks in particular and regulators in general could be more proactive in promoting and incentivizing appropriate innovations in the financial sector and drawing on the experience of other industries may be of considerable value in evolving policies towards financial innovations. Finally, on the effectiveness of regulation, there is considerable agreement that better and more effective regulation is of vital importance in the financial sector and that more regulation is not necessarily better. A possible reason for deficiencies in regulation in the pre-crisis period may have been the loss of information as part of a process of deregulation and a lack of mechanisms to monitor events in the fast changing world of finance. Regulatory effectiveness can be improved by enhancing the monitoring of transactions and analyzing them rigorously. No doubt technology enables market participants to operate in a fraction of seconds. But the same technology is available for regulators too to collect information, monitor and analyze in an equally fast fashion. <laughs>
modern technology minimizes the cost of reporting and to some extent analysis by regulators. Close monitoring by regulators may enhance compliance with the regulation and help in fine tuning the regulatory prescriptions on an ongoing timely basis. In debates relating to public policy and public utilities, issues of regulation, competition, and ownership were considered in an integrated manner. Now that we are revisiting the whole issue of the financial sector, and we recognize that financial sector has significant elements of public utility functions, is it necessary to review the concept of competition, regulation, ownership together, rather than excluding ownership as a relevant consideration altogether. There are some who have argued that too big to fail, if they're too big to fail and too big to regulate, then they can as well be nationalized. I don't know whether it's right or not. But I think the debate should not ignore viewing competition, regulation, ownership in an integrated fashion and then come to the conclusion. In revisiting the issue of regulation, in, uh, of course, we have to recognize our previous experience in this regard. Finally, the use of fiscal and related instruments to supplement regulatory effectiveness could be considered in earnest. Information generated for purpose of taxation is likely to be of great practical use for regulators in monitoring financial sector activities. Levying financial transaction taxes could be considered with rates that discriminate against excessive speculation. The cross-border activities of financial intermediation could be brought within the tax net and thus the regulatory ambit by adopting the issuance principle and the residence principle. Further, evasion could be discouraged by adopting the example of stamp duty. There is also a significant merit in considering the anti-avoidance rules in taxation for regulation of the financial sector as well. There is also a significant merit in trying to adopt the same principles that are adopted in regard to tax avoidance. Thus, if the sole purpose of an instrument or institution in the financial sector is to avoid a regulation. If that is the sole purpose, such transactions can be considered void for the purpose of regulation. Thus a distinction can be made in financial sector regulation, as in the case of taxation, between planning, avoidance, and evasion. Above all, taxation and the use of information, thus acquired for regulation of financial sector, would considerably enhance the effectiveness of both fiscal and financial management. Friends, society has put its trust in central banks. Central banks have to ensure that bank management and the financial sector in general serve the masses and not merely the elite or the financially active. In the ultimate analysis, central banks are trustees, agents to look after the interests of the masses. Thank you all for your patience.